welcome everyone in this session we'll be looking about the oral cavity and pharynx disorders so candidiasis now it is of two types rather three types first is pseudomembranous type commonly known as thrush in this creamy white curd like patches that reveal a raw bleeding surface when scraped it can be asked as an mcq what are the diseases in which the uh, patches when removed bleed so one of them is candidiasis other type of candidiasis is erythematous type in which reddish lesion is seen and third one is candidial leukoplakia in which white lesions are seen which are non removable aphthous ulcers they are the most common oral ulcers seen in these ulcers the yellow base is there which is surrounded by erythematous border and when they are recurrent aphthous ulcers that disease is known as sutton's disease now black hairy tongue it is actually the elongation of filiform papilla which becomes stained with tea coffee or tobacco four days spots due to the hyperplasia of the sebaceous glands some spots can be seen in the tongue they are known as four days spots now kaposi's sarcoma the palate is most commonly involved red or purple plaques which may enlarge and ulcerate and it is also associated with hiv or non hodgkins lymphoma macroglossia what are the condition which macroglossia that is large tongue seen they are down syndrome simpson golabi behmel syndrome just to remember the name back with weidman syndrome amyloidosis acromegaly and cretinism now median rhomboid glossitis it is a congenital anomaly with denuded area in the median posterior part of tongue it may be associated with candidiasis now comes oral submucous fibrosis that is osmf it is to the due to the local irritation dietary deficiency collagen disorder females are commonly affected and it is a pre malignant condition now in this case trismus is seen trismus means difficulty in opening the mouth there are various gradings of the trismus two gradings i'll let, tell you one is according to the mouth opening according to the fingers that is like this four finger mouth opening three finger mouth opening two finger mouth opening one finger mouth opening grade 1 2 3 4 another grading is according to the size in centimeters so if it is more than 35 cm mouth opening it is grade 1 35 to 15 it is grade 2 less than 15 is grade 3 and absolutely no mouth opening it is grade 4 trismus what is the treatment of submucous fibrosis first of all you have to eliminate the culprit that is tobacco or whatever the patient is smoking or chewing and submucosal injections of trimsulonone acetate it is a topical steroid and hyaluronidase they have been shown to increase the mouth opening in patients with trismus due to submucous fibrosis next thing is ludwig's angina what is ludwig's angina it is the cellulitis of the floor of the mouth and submandibular spaces now the submandibular space it is further divided into two parts sublingual and submaxillary by the mylohyoid the space which is above the mylohyoid muscle it is known as sublingual space while the one which is below the mylohyoid it is known as submaxillary space both these combine to form the submandibular space now 80% of these ludwig's angina it is caused by the dental infections if the tooth involved is a premolar so sublingual space will be involved while molar if it is involved so it spreads to submaxillary space and mostly second and the third molars molars are involved streptococcus viridans and e coli they are the most common organisms isolated from the pus and sometimes mixed infection is also seen with containing both aerobes and anaerobes the ludwig's angina it may spread to the parapharyngeal and the retropharyngeal spaces now some other disorders of the oral cavity one is patterson brown kelly syndrome also known as pv syndrome or plummer vinson syndrome it is associated with iron deficiency almost seen exclusively in women and in this esophageal wear and post cricoid carcinoma is seen so you can say it is a triad of iron deficiency anemia post cricoid carcinoma and it is seen in women 
carcinoma lip it is the most common cancer of the oral cavity and lower lip is most commonly involved 98% of the carcinoma of the lip involves it, it is of squamous uh, cell carcinoma type basal cell carcinoma the rule of 90s apply what is rule of 90s uh, mcq may be asked in which they directly they can ask the rule of 90s is seen in so it is basal cell carcinoma so 90% occurs in the lower lip 90% have 5 year survival rate of if less than 2 cm and 90% 90% are squamous cell carcinomas so this is the rule of 90s for basal cell carcinoma now lower lip has axillateral and contralateral lymphatic drainage into level 1 2 3 nodes now what are the level of nodes 1 2 3 that we will see in the next session and uh, upper lip it has only axillateral drainage no contralateral drainage for upper lip similarly carcinoma of buccal mucosa again squamous cell carcinoma is the most common type and the commonest site involved in the buccal mucosa is the buccal sulcus submandibular and upper deep cervical nodes are involved now carcinoma of tongue it is a most common site in the tongue where carcinoma occurs it is the lateral border of the tongue from the lateral border the submandibular and the upper deep cervical nodes are involved and if it involves the tip then it spreads into the submandibular submental and lower deep jugular lymph nodes these are the level of lymph, lymph nodes we'll see in next session now one mcq asked is abbe eslinder flap what is abbe eslinder flap it is a full thickness flap which is rotated from mid lower lip to fill the upper lip defects so the flap is it, it is rotated from the lower lip it fills the defects in the upper lip and blood supply of this flap is from the superior on the inferior labial artery which are the branches of facial artery next is the most common benign tumor of oral cavity is squamous papilloma now remember we are talking now about benign tumor so it is squamous papilloma and if a mcq comes that most common malignant tumor then it is of course squamous cell carcinoma so most common benign tumor of oral cavity is squamous papilloma human papilloma virus 6 and 11 they have been shown to be involved in this tumor now there are some pre-malignant lesions of oral cavity they are leukoplakia which is homogeneous type nodular type or erythro leukoplakia type in which there is combination of erythroplakia and leukoplakia similarly there is erythroplakia which can be of homogeneous type speckled type or erythro leukoplakia and lichen planus next is salivary glands so 75% of the salivary gland tumors arise in parotid gland 80% of these are benign so uh, mcq can be framed that most common tumors of the salivary glands occur in parotid and most of them that is 80% they are benign pleomorphic adenoma is the most common tumor of salivary gland and most commonly it occurs in the parotid gland so parotid is very much involved and pleomorphic adenoma is the most common salivary gland tumor Second most common benign tumor of salivary gland is Worthen's tumor, also known as adenolymphoma. Most common malignant tumor of parotid is mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So two tumors to be remembered, one is benign pleomorphic adenoma, other one is malignant mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And most common malignant tumor of minor salivary gland is adenoid cystic carcinoma. The quality of this tumor is that it shows perineural spread. Now these things look confusing but there is very big difference between these two. Most common malignant tumor of parotid is mucoepidermoid carcinoma and most common malignant tumor of minor salivary glands is adenoid cystic carcinoma. Remember parotid is a major salivary gland. Now most common benign tumor of parotid in children, again this can be asked as a NCQ, it is hemangioma, not pleomorphic adenoma. It is hemangioma especially in children. Next we move on to pharynx. So what is the level of pharynx? Pharynx extends from the skull base to the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. It is around 12 to 14 centimeters in length. Now width it is 3.5 centimeters at the base and 1.5 centimeter at the cricoesophageal junction. Cricoesophageal junction it is the narrowest part of digestive tract. It can be asked as a MCQ. Now pharynx can be divided into three parts. One is nasopharynx, second is oropharynx, third is hypopharynx or laryngopharynx. 
So first is nasopharynx. The extension of the nasopharynx is from the skull base to the plane passing through the heart palate. The pharyngeal opening of the eustachian tube, it is situated 1.2 cm behind the posterior end of the inferior turbinate and bounded above and behind by torus tuberis behind which is a recess known as fossa of Rosenmuller. So two words are to be noted here. One is torus tuberis and other one is the fossa of Rosenmuller. They have clinical importance which will come later. Now nasopharyngeal bursa. It represents the attachment of a notochord to the pharyngeal endoderm. Clinical importance is that abscess or cyst here it is known as Thornwald's disease. It is asked as a MCQ Thornwald's disease. Nasopharyngeal bursitis sometimes it is known as. Now there is one more term known as sinus of Morgagni. It is a space between the skull base and the upper free border of superior constrictor muscle. What is the importance of this sinus of Morgagni? The eustachian tube, the levator palati muscle and the ascending palatine artery. They, the three things they pass through the sinus of Morgagni. The MCQ can be framed in which some fourth question, uh, term is given and except type of MCQ can be given. Now passivant's ridge. It is a mucosal ridge which is raised by the fibers of the palatopharyngeus and the superior constrictor muscle. It cuts off the nasopharynx from the oropharynx during deglutition and speech. Next part of the pharynx is oropharynx from the hard palate up to the high output. It is opposite to the C2 and C3 cervical vertebra. Third part is hypopharynx also known as laryngopharynx from hyoid bone up to the lower border of the cricoid opposite the C3 to C6 cervical vertebra. Now the laryngopharynx it is, can, it is further subdivided into three subsites which are pyriform fossa, post cricoid region and posterior pharyngeal wall. Now pyriform fossa. The clinical importance of pyriform fossa is that foreign bodies they lodge here generally when they move into the laryngopharynx. And one more thing, internal laryngeal nerve it runs submucosally in the pyriform fossa. So it is easily accessible to anesthesia and referred pain to the ear is because of involvement of this nerve. All these three things can be asked as a MCQ. The foreign bodies in pyriform fossa, anesthesia because of internal laryngeal nerve and referred pain to the ear. The second subsite of hypopharynx is the post cricoid region. Again, MCQ, it is a site of carcinoma in females. We just now saw it from our Wilson syndrome. Okay, now this table, many MCQs can be, can be framed from this tables. All are like all except, all except type of questions. So, briefly, all muscles of the pharynx are supplied by pharyngeal plexus which constitutes 9th, 10th, 9th nerve, 10th nerve and sympathetic plexus except stylopharynges which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So this was like one MCQ. All muscles of pharynx are supplied by um, pharyngeal plexus except stylopharynges which is supplied by glossopharynges. Similarly, all muscles of palate are supplied by pharyngeal plexus again except tensor villi palatine which is supplied by medial pterygoid nerve. So these things are just to be remembered. Third thing in the same category is all muscles of the tongue are supplied by hypoglossal nerve which is the 12th cranial nerve except palatoglossus which is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus. All muscles of the facial expression are supplied by the facial nerve which is the 7th cranial nerve except levator palpebrae superioris which is supplied by oculomotor nerve. And lastly, all muscles of the mastication, they are supplied by mandibular division of trigeminal nerve. That is uh, fifth, third branch of fifth cranial nerve, except buccinator, which is supplied by seventh cranial nerve, that is facial nerve. So every line has a MCQ in itself. Now comes palatine tonsils. Now there is one term, plica triangular, triangularis. It covers the anterior inferior part of tonsils and plica semilunaris, it covers the upper pole of the tonsil. Basically, these are mucosal folds. The lining mucosa of the tonsil is non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. And each tonsil has around 15 to 20 crypts. So if we see in this diagram,
this is the median surface of the tonsil it is showing these crypts so around 15 to 20 crypts are present over the median surface of the tonsil out of these 20 crypts the one crypt is a large one which is known as crypta magna intratonsillar cleft it is a persistent of ventral portion of second pharyngeal pouch again it is a development and anomaly intratonsillar cleft a tonsil is divided into two parts by presence of a large cleft between the tonsil because of the persistence of ventral portion of the second pharyngeal pouch now tonsillar bed that is the lateral part of the tonsil now there are some important structures which are present in the lateral part of the tonsils from medial to lateral they are paratonsillar vein superior constrictor muscle styloglossus glossopharyngeal nerve facial artery medial pterygoid muscle pharyngobasilar fascia and buccopharyngeal fascia so mcq can be asked which of the following structures are all our structures are present except or which of the following structure is present in the bed or the order may be changed so this order is important from medial to lateral what is the nerve supply of the tonsil it is tonsillar branch of ninth nerve that is glossopharyngeal nerve and upper part of tonsil it is sometimes supplied by the lesser palatine nerve now blood supply of tonsil so it is from these arteries that is tonsillar branch of facial artery ascending palatine branch of facial artery dorsal lingual branch of lingual artery descending palatine branch of maxillary artery and tonsillar branch of ascending pharyngeal artery five branches now venous drainage from the paratonsillar vein which we saw in the bed of the tonsil the venous drainage goes into the pharyngeal plexus then ultimately into the internal jugular vein and lymphatic drainage of the tonsil it is in the upper deep jugulodigastric nodes now comes tonsillitis so what is tonsillitis it is the inflammation of the tonsillar tissue acute tonsillitis which is further divided into four parts acute catarrhal or viral now one important clinical feature of any system which is involved by a virus is that not only a particular site but two three sites are involved like it is not only tonsillitis it will be tonsillopharyngitis if it is viral so pharynx is always involved along with larynx along with tonsils so this thing is to be remembered here acute follicular in this purulent materials the purulent material they come in they fix here which is known as acute follicular tonsillitis they are present in these crypts purulent material now when all these purulent material they combine they form a sort of membrane so that is known as acute membranous tonsillitis and when the whole of the substance of the tonsil is involved not only these crypts but the whole substance then it is known as acute parenchymatous involvement of the tonsil most common organism causing acute tonsillitis is beta hemolytic streptococcus followed by staphylococcus haemophilus pneumococcus and in viruses most common virus causing tonsillitis is adenovirus followed by epstein barr virus and influenza virus now what are the complications of tonsil so tonsil tonsillitis tonsillitis can complicate into quincy what is quincy it is a peritonsillar abscess we'll come to it later it can complicate into rheumatic fever or acute glomerulonephritis the later two are the systemic diseases caused by the same organism that is beta hemolytic streptococcus now there is a differential diagnosis of membrane over tonsil important mcqs can be formed from these now first differential diagnosis is diphtheria clinically how to differentiate it from membrane of tonsillitis now the differential diagnosis of membrane over a tonsil there are various other conditions also which can produce a membrane like we saw in this acute tonsillitis so first condition is diphtheria clinically when you remove the membrane it will bleed or it bleeds on touch also second is vincent angina it is caused by fusiform bacilli and spirochetes known as borrelia vincenti it is a necrotic membrane which forms over gums and also sometimes over the tonsils so this mcq can be asked vincent angina is caused by it is caused by fusiform bacilli and spirochetes such as borrelia vincenti next one is infectious mononucleosis again a mcq what is the diagnosis diagnostic test of infectious mononucleosis that is paul bunnell test and also high grade fever with lymphadenopathy is seen in agranulocytosis also there is formation of membrane over the tonsils 
also sometimes in leukemia and carcinoma of tonsil so all these conditions are to be differentiated from acute tonsillitis and investigated accordingly now comes chronic tonsillitis again it can be chronic follicular we saw small follicles present in the crypts chronic parenchymatous whole of the substances involved chronic fibroid in which after the chronic recurrent inflammation the tonsil tissue decreases in size now there are three cardinal features of chronic tonsillitis which can be asked in any way in mcqs first is flushing of the anterior pillars second is irwin moore sign that is pus on pressure whenever there is chronic tonsillitis and we press the tonsil the pus will come start coming out from the crypts and the third one is the enlarged jugular digastric nodes so these three are the cardinal features of chronic tonsillitis now we come to quincy also known as peri tonsillar abscess now it is the collection of pus between the fibrous capsule and the superior constrictor again this is a mcq that pus in quincy is collected between which two layers so fibrous capsule and superior constrictor layer it is the commonest site of quincy is the upper pole of the tonsil and there is trismus in quincy that is inability to open the mouth because of the spasm of the pterygoid muscle now what is hot tonsillectomy when tonsillectomy is performed in acute stage for example a patient is having quincy and we perform a tonsillectomy it is known as hot tonsillectomy and what is interval tonsillectomy after 6 weeks of the acute attack once the acute attack subsides and then we go for surgery that is known as interval tonsillectomy still continuing with the tonsils we move on to the tonsillar malignancy in children lymphoma is most common tumor to involve the tonsils while in adults mucoepidermal carcinoma is the most common tonsillar malignancies now another confusing term with quincy is the quincy's disease that was quincy this is quincy's disease this is the acute edema of uvula it is known as quincy's disease what is keratosis pharyngeus it is a benign horny excrescence on the tonsillar surface many times we eat food and it gets stuck in the these crepts and it leads to the formation of pus also so this is a benign condition it is horny excrescences on the tonsillar surface the treatment is regular gargles and removal and reassurance of course next is retropharyngeal abscess now retropharyngeal space it extends from the skull base up to the bifurcation of the trachea it can be asked as a mcq and it is divided into two lateral spaces by uh, which are known as the lateral spaces of gillette now this again is an mcq nodes of ruvier these are the constant lateral group of retropharyngeal lymph nodes and what is the treatment incision and drainage of the pus that is the pus is to be removed but the important thing is that it is gen done without general anesthesia because if the patient is put under anesthesia the pus goes into or aspirates the pus it will be uh, fatal it is done without general anesthesia so that if the pus ever gets inside the patient can cough out the pus and if the pus is large and obstructing the airway uh, prophylactic tracheostomy is to be done now chronic retropharyngeal abscess it is a chronic abscess which is caused by the tuberculosis of the cervical spine this is the cause so there will be loss of normal curvature of the cervical spine and it needs to be drained but externally if it is a high abscess the vertical incision along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid if it is a low abscess then vertical incision along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid can, can be asked as a mcq next is parapharyngeal space parapharyngeal abscess so parapharyngeal abscess it is from the skull base up to the higher bone only not up till the bifurcation of trachea like that of the retropharyngeal parapharyngeal space is like an inverted five sided pyramid it has two compartments the prestyloid and the poststyloid compartment the prestyloid contains mainly muscles like pterygoids and tensor villi palatini while the poststyloid compartment is important because it is the it contains the neurovascular bundle the internal carotid artery the internal jugular vein the cranial nerves 9th 10th 11th and 12th that is the lower four cranial nerves now abscess is drained to a collar incision in the neck at the level of hyoid bone so these are the various sites of abscesses of the parapharyngeal and the retropharyngeal region okay next thing is adenoids now adenoids they are located at the junction of nasopharyngeal roof and posterior pharyngeal wall they are lined by ciliated columnar epithelium the difference between adenoids and tonsils is 
that they adenoids they do not have these crypts over their surface they involute after puberty that is around the age of 12 to 13 they start involuting and nasopharyngeal mass in neonates always suspect encephalocele if a question is asked that a neonate presents with a nasopharyngeal mass so always suspect encephalocele now what are adenoid facies because of enlargement of the adenoids the patient is not able to breathe through the nose so he has to open the mouth and breathe now because of constant opening of the mouth there is some typical facies of uh, the mouth which is known as adenoid facies characterized by elongated dull face high arched palate crowded upper teeth open mouth pinched nasal ala and systemic pulmonary obstruction tonsillectomy so what are the indications of tonsillectomy it is the recurrent tonsillitis what is recurrent tonsillitis seven attacks in one year or five attacks in two consecutive years or three attacks in three consecutive years then recurrent quincy diphtheria carriers rheumatic fever as an approach to stylodectomy these are all indications of tonsillectomy one important contraindication which is frequently asked as a mcq is that during a polio epidemic tonsillectomy is contraindicated because after tonsillectomy the nerve endings are exposed and it can lead to the spread of polio now laser surgery is also being done laser removal of the tonsillectomy the most common laser used is ktp 532 laser now what are the complications of tonsillectomy again a frequently asked question is the most common complication of tonsillectomy is hemorrhage the hemorrhage can be divided into primary reactionary or secondary primary hemorrhage is during the surgery when some vessel is injured or low what is reactionary hemorrhage it is within 24 hours of surgery after the completion of surgery up till the 24 hours that is reactionary hemorrhage and it is venous in origin and what is secondary hemorrhage after 24 hours it can occur now what are the causes of reactionary hemorrhage it is the reflex vasodilatation when the effect of anesthetic drugs are gone and also the slipping of the ligature how to manage the reactionary hemorrhage remove the clots and pressure with adrenal gland removal of clot is frequently asked as mcq then what is the management of reactionary hemorrhage to so removal of the clots and secondary hemorrhage which occurs after the 24 hours of the primary surgery that is because of the infection now one more term is Zenker's diverticulum or pulsion diverticulum most commonly they arise from the cricopharynx through Kilian's dehiscence Kilian's dehiscence it is a weak area between the thyropharynges and the cricopharynges part of inferior constrictor muscle now two or three MCQs can be framed from this line first is what is Kilian's dehiscence second is what are the parts of the inferior constrictor muscle from which it arises and the third is that it is a pulsion diverticulum seen after the age of 60 years more common almost two times more common males one important sign is boy's sign that is swelling gurgles on palpation once we try to palpate and reduce the swelling gurgling sounds occur and the surgical procedure used to correct this diverticulum is Dolman's procedure again an MCQ it is the endoscopic diathermy of diverticuloesophageal septum the diverticuloesophageal septum is removed endoscopically using a diathermy this concludes this session